Steve Bassman here uh, with me. He is um, a co-founder with myself and is our CE. Um, I'm Neil Calvert. I'm uh, uh, the Chief Operating Officer, and many of you have had conversations with me through my role as um, Head of Customer Success. So it's great to be uh, having this opportunity to talk to you. Okay, um, Stu, why don't you kick us off? All right, guys. Uh, good afternoon, it's Stu here. Um, I know that Neil said that you know we've we've picked a fairly in-depth subject to um to start with, and you know with a title like applied infonomics and weapons and monetize, it probably feels feels a bit of a challenge. But you know, really, it comes down to some fairly straightforward challenges that I think we uh, we all face. Um, and you know, just chuck them up on the screen there. Yeah, you know, have you have you ever struggled with some of the issues up there? Um, you know, do you um We've all got loads and loads of information, but um, you know, what can we do to generate value from that information? Sometimes we just collect it, and we don't know what to do with it, other than the the initial reason that we've collected it. And you know, how um, how do you educate people to make them realise that information is actually an asset? Um, more and more, we are seeing that um, chief data officers are actually expected to create revenue and you can only begin to do that if you understand you're dealing with an asset rather than a liability and what is you know, do you ever struggle to understand what your inventory is um is it accurate is it current um because if you don't know that then there's absolutely no chance of of making money from it and then lastly um you know, people used to talk about information being power Information's never been power. Let's face it, it's what you do with the information that makes you powerful. And you can either make your organization powerful or you can create silos and individuals within that inf within the organization hoard the information to make themselves sound powerful. So, you know, really this is about using the information for the good and success of the business rather than independence. Um, so moving on, now that we've we've spoken about what 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 we all struggle with, um, you know, next up, um, why should we bother to actually address the challenge? Well, yeah, I mean, I, and I'll, I'll open this up to Neil as well for a bit of a conversation. But I think you know, first up, um, you know, the first two really, um, increasing customer acquisition and customer service. Um, 2018 has been spoken of as the year of the customer and with all of us um, expecting instant gratification uh, in, in all aspects of life, if we um, as, as, as businesses fail to recognize that customer need, that societal need, then we begin to, um, to fall behind. And uh, Neil, um, you know, using examples in government, I think there's, um, you know, we've done some work where we've really seen government agencies who have picked up on the, on this need um, and have therefore started supporting the taxpayer very well. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting part of uh, the customer experience, customer service side of things is, is that it it is crossing into government as well, which I think traditionally has been exempt from people thinking that they need to provide a, a positive customer experience. Um, the work we've been doing in the education sector in New Zealand with the Tertiary Education Commission uh, has shown how, or uh, if we take this information-centric approach, we can we can model the customer journey. Uh, and in, in this case, it was helping TEC demonstrate to other agencies in the education sector that uh, there's a, just an inordinate amount of information duplication um, that takes place when you think about a citizen going through their, their education career and wanting to engage with government, um, especially when it comes to assistance for further education. And uh, if we were able to just reconsider where I provide my, my personal data to in terms of dealing with government and have them pivot their thinking to enabling proactive services rather than relying on me to know when I need to deal with them, we end up with a significantly different customer experience. And that's the way in New Zealand, right? I'm thinking about customer life journeys and customer events. And with that increased understanding driven by uh, the information need for any of those agencies, we can get to proactive government rather than reactive. So I think, I mean, that's um, you know, a really great example of where 
um, organisations that really don't, you know, and, and it's, it's not fair to say they don't care about the bottom line, but revenue isn't isn't really their business, um, are, are using information as an asset. But um, look at the, uh, the utilities and the, um, and the telco organisations or companies um, you know, they are they are all creating new revenue streams, and we're seeing in the utility space that um, with the move towards green energy and um, and 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 the econ the, the green economy, that you know, many of these organisations are having to recognise the fact that old revenue streams are going to dry up, and the more forward leaning ones are the ones that have stepped into the information space. And are beginning to aggregate their information to create new revenue streams and jump onto um, to, to that green economy. Any thoughts there? Oh well, our, our experience, I guess, is um, uh, in New Zealand has been uh, driving the, da the data group to understand how information drives customer again through the organisation. Mm -hmm. um, it it's. Um, Typically comes uh, al along with, um, I want to reduce wait time for customers so I can push more people through my pipe. Uh, I can deliver the service that they are requesting sooner than I otherwise would have been able to. So, so that understanding of, of wait time and why that is incurred through, uh, because of my current processes, my current systems has been fundamental to driving those new revenue. And I think that becomes even more important as we consider what new markets um, will look like and what the demands of the customer who in some cases you think energy they become the provider as well in that circumstance of the of the very utility that's been sold so this um this understanding of, of how uh, information is going to drive these these new markets is going to become fundamental and uh, just you know on on the on the call I'm um, just to acknowledge um, Dave Cottrell from Magic Minds uh, in the US now there are there are a partner of ours, um, primarily well, based in the utility sector. Um, so it's great to have uh, Dave on board and um, see that uh, this type of thinking uh, and the drive for infonomics is, is actually being taken on board by um, organizations that want to deliver these new capabilities in, into the marketplace. And then moving down the list, um, but b before we do, um, Paul, a uh, great point in the, um, in the chat box. Um, and um, we'll come on to um, to dealing with compliance for regulations uh, towards the um, towards the end of the um, the webinar. But yeah, completely take your point that sometimes we have to spend money just to make sure that um, we're not breaking the law or we're upholding the ethics of our organisation. Um, so yeah, yeah, reducing operational costs and identifying reducing fraud. Um, you know, we've got examples of organisations that you know from within the first two weeks of beginning to understand their, um, their information as an asset rather than a liability. They, you know, they're finding hundreds of thousands of dollars of savings. And all of those, you know, the, the six points we've, we've really just rattled through, develop a competitive edge. And that's the important thing that as we, as we really recognize the move away from the industrial age and properly harness the information age, those that do it early will have This, this accounts for 74% of the Fortune 500 companies who won't be there in the next three years. Um, they, um, they they fall off the bandwagon. So with that, I will hand on to Neil to actually dive into what Infonomics actually is. No, thanks, Jim. So if we if we consider this environment that we found ourselves in, um, I think it's worth just starting from the perspective of we've, we've got this relatively new term. I mean, Gartner produced their, their book, Infonomics, at the beginning of this year. Um, but it is a conversation that's really been going on for three years or so. Uh, but it's, it's actually getting traction. Um, so if we start off with a fairly dry definition of Infonomics. It's, it comes out as the economic theory of recognizing information as a new asset class and the discipline of measuring, managing, and monetizing information just as any other enterprise asset. So what we are fundamentally talking about here is being able to deal with the information that we have inside our organization, whatever that is, as an asset that we manage effectively uh, in, uh, using the same principles we might do if we, if we have stuff um, that, that we're looking after. This doesn't necessarily happen today, and, and it's certainly true that the value of your information asset does not contribute um, to your business um, P&L. So it is not a, an item that you can list 
that has a financial value um, which will influence the overall value of your organization. So as we think about these three aspects, measurement, management, and monetization, it is worth just thinking about what that really means because the first uh, part of this, uh, your ability to measure your information and um, the three principal things there, as you can see, are quality, value, and economics. Uh, it, that this actually requires a bit of work. And so what we are seeing are six uh, principal methods um, of thinking about the, the, the measurement that you need to put in place to be able to quantify the value of your information to start with. They, they go um, a bit like, so one method is to think about the intrinsic, which is if I have um, high quality available information available uh, to, to my organization, which is exclusive and proprietary, um, it has more value than other information that might be available. So that's, that's an intrinsic view. Um, business value is about the utility of the information asset in terms of its actual business usage. So there's a quantifiable thing there about how much is it used, and that, that can be a measure of value. Um, performance value of information is the third one, and this is where the, the impact of the information asset um, as a business objective, uh, but it's represented through KPIs, through key performance indicators. So I'm directly connecting how I measure success in my organization uh, to the information that enables those key KPIs to be delivered. Um, the the uh, fourth view is a cost value of information, which really is about the financial expense that's required to generate, capture, or code it. So this is more of a traditional view where I'm beginning to understand all of the, the things that go on inside the business to create my information, and I'm purely valuing it on, on that cost basis. That's linked to the market value of information, which is the potential or actual financial value of an information asset on the open marketplace. So this uh, presumes that you have a, a mechanism to be able to, to um, sell that information, so to market it and to sell it. Um, and then the final one is the economic value of information, which is where we begin to take a more traditional income approach, um, where, where information is, is driving revenue for me, but then I'm subtracting the life cycle expenses associated with information. So there's a a positive element and a negative element that needs to be considered. And so the first task really is to um, understand what it is that you're trying to measure so that you can you can put this um, filter over the top of your information that then allows you to apply some management to it. And if we think about that second um, area, then it, it's primarily about the information management function within the organization. And Stu already mentioned that we're beginning to see the introduction of the chief data officer and the office of the chief data officer as a, a role or a team inside the organization taking responsibility for the management. Um, they, they're, they're about being on the offensive um, with information rather than defensive. So we're moving away from this uh, internal view of risk mitigation and putting barriers up to protect my data and my information inside my organization to actually releasing it um, and, and looking for opportunities to do things with it. As Stu mentioned, this CDO function often has a, a revenue uh, associated with it. So it has expectations around generating revenue and it, and it is managing a, a P&L. And so it's important to begin to understand the opportunity to um, deploy information in this way. But you're very likely not to have one today. Uh, there are only three to 4,000 of these globally, these CDO roles, 80% um, of which have been created in the last two years. And in Asia Pacific, um, we only have 8% of the total. And I think that accounts for 4% in Australia and less than 2% in New Zealand. So it's, um, it is a new position, but, but be on the, on the lookout for it, I think, because if you have one or you are thinking of one, then you are taking a very bold step um, into this whole infonomic space. The final aspect of this is that whole monetization piece. And, and that really has to start from understanding what your asset is, um, building up that knowledge inside the organization so that we can begin to explore what the opportunities are. And, and that comes from this exercise of justifying um, why you have that information, being inspired about the opportunity to, to do new things with it, and then getting on and executing that. And around that area of monetization are these principles that are being driven um, data and information literacy and information as a second language, because the only way of, of really being able to introduce the concept of monetization into an organization is have everyone talking about it 
consistently so that that level of understanding builds. Um, so when we are talking about change, whether that's continuous change or whether it is transformation to this dramatic um, response to the digital economy, we are including information in a consistent way so everybody understands what they're talking about. So infonomics as a topic um, covers all of those things. And as you can see, you can dive into a significant amount of detail in how you might implement any of this through the organization. So to pick up on really you know, where, where would you start, um, one of the key things that we are finding is uh, we need to really consider um, where or how you go about building your inventory. And, and we've got to move away from just thinking about data in our databases, which is operational data information about your customers, suppliers, partners, employees, things that you protect internally, it's transactional, it might be some of your master data, and really dig around to find all of these other repositories um, and supplies of information, because it's the combination of all of these that actually presents the biggest opportunity. So if we quickly run through a few of those, dark data, for example, information that's collected and stored but not generally accessible, um, it is being widely accepted now that this provides the greatest immediate opportunity for most businesses amongst all type of data to find content which could be derived from, extracted from this typically unstructured data in a structured way combined with other data sources in order to drive value. Um, commercial data has to be considered. This is we buy content from data providers that tend to be um, industry specific and we're able to merge that with our own in order to spot trends across the marketplace and uh, really understand how we might drive new new product services solutions applications into the marketplace and of course government is now uh, into open data they're providing um, content around health welfare citizen service data um, we we need to be mashing this up with other data sources so that we can really understand what the market is looking like and and we, everyone knows about social media data so how do we take the blogs, the yammers, the tweets, the posts, um, and use this to really think about how social trends and attitudes and behaviors, likes and dislikes, are, are developing. Because if, if we can do that, then we have another leader on predicting market change from the very people we're trying to um, excite about the, the way that we're operating as organizations, you know, our customer. And, and finally, the internet. How do we scrape content from partners and competitors? Uh, in order to understand what they're doing and, and add all of this context into our own information repository so we can build this new level of knowledge. Those are just some things to consider. When we do that, we begin to see that value is everywhere. Um, and we, we move away from this traditionally financial focused view of, of information um, in a limited aspect. And this is some research that our research student, Julia, is doing. Uh, she, she's working with Victoria University of Wellington and ourselves and is beginning to think about what does it really mean to consider the value that information delivers through the organization. So you're not expected to read all of these things, but it, it's an indication that if we start thinking a bit more accurately about uh, how information flows through the organization, we can, we can build this new view. And this is to help us um, build the case for information value through, through the business. This distills down to Key uh, five key information value areas that, that we think about, um, and you can see those there. This this ranges from intellectual capital, um, where, we're, where we're thinking about uh, information as a as a price system, where information's static. Um, thinking about maybe the value chain management, where where information becomes a commodity, and it's about enabling processes through the organisation, uh, all the way to um, decision support, where the information is enabling people's decisions to act. Um, and where the information is having a, a, a really positive contribution to decision making. So we, we see um, the, the opportunity for organizations to think about value in, in an area that they're comfortable in. And then by understanding the relationship between each of those elements, really take that value to other parts of the business. And so we, we see these value relationships being built where we, we are thinking about um, the people that are involved, so the actors. We're thinking about the actions that people perform, those processes, and, and the, the objects that are created, the information entities. And if we, if we understand how we can move between these value areas, we can very quickly take this concept of, of value 
uh, in, in our area of comfort and apply it to other parts of the organization. And, and that just adds an, an exponential weight to this whole conversation. One of the ways of being able to do that is through the information supply chain. And so as a construct, this really is taking that view of a, a supply chain being how something moves from A to B and, and everything that happens to it in between, and now applying it to the information assets inside the organization. So in February 2018, Gartner produced their uh, information supply chain um, logic, which uh, talks about inputs, the logic presentation, questions, decision, actions, and outcomes. This is something that we as an organization have been talking about for uh, many years since, since February 2015 with um, our construct of an information supply chain being actions, creating information, supporting actions, creating information, and so on, enabled by people and systems. And this, this can be one mechanism that you can use to take all of that thinking and that learning um, as you are beginning to document where your assets are inside the organization and building them into this common framework that you can then share with everybody else. This is where we start really getting into the nuts and bolts of what of the, of the things we have to do first when we when we consider infonomics, which is building this this uh, modern day catalog um, of of everything that we have. Okay, so um, so Neil, thanks. Um, seven minutes to get through the last twenty five slides. Um, <laughs> so so rather than just talking about this in a very generic term, now that we understand infonomics, um, let's talk about your information asset within your organisation. And there are the questions that you, you, we really have to get a grip of to understand it. To simplify that, it's the five W's um, of information. Who, what, why, where, and when. Um, and you know, going, to, um, going to Paul's point about compliance and regulations, um, you know, we've got to understand the answer to these questions and deeply understand it because information has, has been in, in that sort of space over the last decade that we've known about it and we haven't been doing much with it but as the as the Cambridge Analytics and Facebook um, story from last month proved um, you know, it's more and more important to understand information even just in in privacy terms in Europe uh, GDPR comes into effect in um, in May this year and even yeah, in New Zealand, we have got privacy laws that are going through Parliament that are likely to, um, to come into law in early 2019. Um, so we are moving away from the space that privacy and right to information is an ethical question to becoming a, a legal question. Um, so you know, not only do we need to understand our information asset in terms of how do we monetize it and therefore find new ways to make money for our organization, but what responsibilities do we have in society to ensure that we, um, we look after uh, the data that we are responsible for? Um, in, in terms of how we, um, how we educate this or how we communicate this, um, we work very closely with, with Gartner. And Gartner have, uh, have coined the, um, the phrase um, information as a second language. Um, and understanding standing data in literacy terms is the, um, is the key. Um, we've worked very closely with, um, with, with Valerie and, um, and, and, and Doug Laney, the, um, the author of Infonomics, um, to properly understand how we go about um, harnessing that information. And what it really becomes is understanding how literate you and your organization actually are. Now, the fact that um, you're all on this webinar would suggest that at worst case, you're at the conversational level because you're interested in finding out about information as an asset. Um, and that's not a bad place to be. There's an awful lot of organizations that aren't even on the first stepping stone. And then right at the, the top end, um, if any of you feel that you're at that multilingual stage, please get in contact because we'd be very interested in having a conversation with you about how about your journey to get there and, um, and where you think the next step is. Um, but really to, um, to, to finish up, and please um, take the opportunity now to, um, to throw some questions into, um, into the chat box, um, really to finish up, um, just uh, yeah, thanks a lot for spending your time here, and I'll let Neil close up. 
but the um, we've developed on a, on our website um, an opportunity to uh, understand where you fit into the the one to five with the information value maturity assessment. Take a look at it, answer a bunch of questions, and you'll you'll get a view in the grand scheme of things. Um, and at least then you're in a position to begin to really look at some of the slides that we've bounced through today very quickly. And, and in doing so, begin to hold that conversation with your own organization and hold yourself and others in the organization to account about how you can be part of using information as an asset. Um, I'll hand over to Neil to close. No, thanks, Steve. Um so we've got um, maybe a couple of minutes left. Uh, I, I think really my closing part, again, to thank you very much indeed for taking the time to come and listen and just reassure this is the first of a, of a set of webinars that we're, we're planning on doing. You know, this, this conversation around the value of information um, really is just a, a start point. And where we want to take it are, are to conversations around uh, actual steps that you can take inside your organization to monetize your information asset um, and what does it look like to, to go on that journey. Um, some of the other techniques that are emerging into the marketplace to help, um, so the move away from just thinking about uh, data and information catalogs being static views of data that you have inside the organization to how they help contextualize the, the use of information um, through the business so that you get this much fuller understanding about how your organization operates. We definitely want to go um, further into information as a, as a second language and data and information literacy. It's the, the key thing that needs to be um, achieved inside an organization to drive those data-driven behaviors that become just part of the organization's culture. Um, culture being the, the top barrier to uh, information growth inside an organization, according to the latest CDO survey. Um, that was done at the back end of last year. So there, there are plenty of things that we that we need to um, that we need to continue to, to talk about. Um, Paul has just dropped another comment in. Um, an organisation that's at the conversation level isn't necessarily going to see the value of information. How can we create the desire to go on the journey? It's a it's a great question, Paul, and I think it comes from us all continuing to. Uh, really present what the benefits are um, of, the, of this approach. You know, the, the work we've been doing over the, the last three years um, as part of our journey with Link has been to help people understand that if you, if you have um, a low level of knowledge about the data and the information that you have inside your organization, you're actually putting your entire business at risk. McKinsey have a huge um, set of reports that uh, were written over the back half of last year all about the crossing the um, the data divide and the digital divide, and what does it mean to uh, ignore the weak signals in the marketplace that are the precursor to this technical disruption in terms of digitizing core processes and the profit erosion that um, you can expect to incur as an organisation if you don't take this seriously. And you know nothing talks louder than money, and so I think um, being able to eloquently present uh, what is likely to be the impact to an organization that doesn't address um, the, the digital economy um, is part of uh, the, the start point for, for this conversation. And, and an, an information um, asset library and an information catalog and a, a data-driven view is part of um, being able to respond to that. So you know that's how I'd, I'd answer that really, is, is just by getting in front of them and helping them understand the consequence of, of not thinking this way. Okay, um, we have come to the end of our, our half hour. It's amazing how quickly that time goes. Um, Dave um, Cottrell's just dropped another note in. Um, we, Dave, will will put something up um, online um, to, to help um, you, you know you enable that conversation with people as well. Now, the comment there is uh, found that many organisations focus on IT first, and as a result, have had many failures. Um, and they can you can demonstrate why when you look at the data. Could not agree more. Um, we know that uh, more than 75% of IT projects fail within three years or, or are abandoned soon afterwards because they failed to deliver the, the value that was described in the business case. Um, and uh, you know, IT is, is an enabler um, inside the organization along, along with people. Um, and they enable the flow of 
data to information to knowledge so that decisions can be made that, that actually do deliver uh, change through the organization. The IT itself is not something that um, drives certainly digital transformation. We're not thinking about putting technology into a bad process and just making that bad process fast. We're talking about innovation and creative and fundamental change um, as a response to